It's good to be back and <clears throat> miss being here Sunday. Miss seeing you all. Thankful everybody. Is everybody's power back on? Anybody doesn't have power now? We don't either. <laughs> so I guess it's just the two of us. Uh, <clears throat> Sarah said this is her first hurricane and she wasn't impressed. And I'm glad you weren't, Sarah. I'm glad you weren't. <clears throat> they're never, they're never as bad as the, um, as the, as the uh, weather guessers want you to think it, it's going to be, and that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, I'm thankful that uh, everybody's, everybody's well. Let's open our Bibles together to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six. <clears throat> Let's hope the Lord spares us of anything that would impress us. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Depend on him for your strength. Look to Christ. And in the power of his might... Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand. Where do we stand? We stand in the same place Moses stood. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, he would have been destroyed by the law had God not said, there's a place near unto me. It's a rock. You stand right there. <laughs> I'm going to cover you up. You'll be safe. The only place to stand Stand, therefore, having your loins gird about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth comes from God's word. Righteousness is all found in Christ. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This gospel gives us peace with God. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for your protection. We thank you, Lord, that you were merciful, as you always are merciful, but we thank you for the, uh, the care that you gave to your children this week and continue to. We thank you especially for your mercy in the sacrifice of thy dear son, the putting away of our sin, the satisfying of thy law, the establishment of justice, the hope of salvation. Oh Lord, we pray now in this hour that you would enable us by your spirit to put on the breastplate of righteousness, to have the shield of faith, to have the helmet of salvation, to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Lord, that you would enable us to, to look to Christ and find uh, all that armor in him and in his finished work of salvation. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand once again. We'll sing the hymn that's on the back of the bulletin.
Last Wednesday night, we looked at the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians, the first couple of verses, and uh, considered the subject of prayer. Tonight, I'd like for us to go back to that same passage, and we'll deal with those verses briefly and then go further into the chapter, uh, considering the subject of being established in God's word. Being established in God's word. Standing firm in the truth. Having the shield of faith, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we know that God's word is a sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to divide and to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that's what we hope every time we go to God's word. Lord, speak to my heart. <laughs> Reveal to me uh, my need for Christ and give to me faith to have hope in Christ. Um, we know that all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul, Paul concludes this letter to the church at Thessalonica by admonishing them to, to hear what God has said and stand firm in the truth that God has spoken. And uh, that's, that's the admonishment for us now. It hasn't changed, has it? Where else are we going to stand? What else, is, what else is sure? What else is certain? What else gives us hope and light and truth? What else reveals to us the glory of Christ and the hope of salvation? Nothing. Nothing. No place else to go. Nobody else got the answers. <laughs> oh, but the word of God didn't come by private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this is the inspired word of God, and it's given to us in order to, in order to reveal the glory of Christ and give to us the hope of salvation. And Paul says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Pray that the word of God might have free course, that the gospel that we preach might run its course and accomplish its purpose. If this is going to happen, it'll happen because God did it. And God will do it as his people pray for him to do it. Lord, would you do that? Now, for God to make the gospel to run freely and to be glorified, it must be declared faithful to its meaning. It must be declared faithful to its meaning. Um, Wicked men will twist the word of God. They will take verses out of context. They will build whole doctrines off of one word or one idea. And uh, if this prayer is to be answered, then we must declare God's word according as it is written. We can't, we can't make, make things up. It, it, if you go to the word of God wanting to prove a position, you can find a verse to prove it. I don't care what position it is. I don't care what position it is. You can find a verse or a part of a verse, or if nothing else, you can find one word somewhere in the word of God to defend your position. You know that passage over there in... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And uh, he said, if there is no resurrection, then why are you uh, baptized for the dead? Now, there's a, been a lot of uh, discussion about what all that means. But one thing I'm sure that it doesn't mean is the conclusion that the Mormons have come to and built their entire doctrine their entire doctrine from that one verse of scripture. Um, it, it's, it's just incredible. If the word of God is to have free course, then it must be preached according to its meaning. 
It's not, it's not up to us to, you know, I, I love what, what Paul said about the, the Bereans. He said they were more noble. And he was talking about the Jews in Berea because it was the Jews in Thessalonica that, that heard the gospel and they didn't like it and they ran them out of town. And he got to Berea and he said the Bereans were more noble. They received the word of God with gladness and they searched the scriptures daily to see if what we said was true. Is this really what God's word means? Yeah, it's really what God's word means. But men will pervert the scriptures. They'll twist it. They'll rest it. That's what the scripture says. They rest it to their own destruction. And that word, I, I've described, I've explained this to you before. I'll do it again because some may, may don't remember or hadn't heard this. But that word rest was a word used to describe what would happen when you put a person on a rack. Stretched them out on a rack. And why would you use that torture method? What you were trying to do was get that person to say something that they wouldn't say otherwise. <laughs> you were torturing them to get them to make a confession that they otherwise would not make. And that's what Paul said, that's what, that's what men do with the word of God. They put it on a rack, they stretch it, they rest it, they, they cause it to say something that it otherwise would not say. So, Lord, give us... Give us light. Give us understanding. Enable us to, to, to declare your word faithfully. Now, how many people have taken uh, John 3.16 and used that to defend free will, used that to defend universal atonement, for God so loved the world, and they take one word, world, and they take it out of its context from everywhere else where that word is used, and say, well, see there, God loves everybody. God wants everybody to be saved. And everybody's got a free will. Whosoever will. And they completely ignore everything else that the scripture says. Um, there's a passage in, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, verse 9. Where the Lord says that he is not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. And, of course, people, t that's part of the verse, but that's not the whole verse. Turn with me to that passage of Scripture, 2 Peter, 2 Peter, <clears throat> chapter 3. See, people say, well, you know, God, God wants to save everybody. If God willed to save everybody, everybody would be saved. God sovereignly chose a particular people according to his own will and purpose before time ever began. And Christ actually accomplished the salvation of those whom God chose in the covenant of grace. And none of those will perish. You can be sure of it. He's not going to lose one of his sheep. Every single one for whom Christ died, every single one that God elected in grace will be saved and will be brought to repentance and that's what this verse means but people will take the second half of that verse not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and they'll ignore the first part of it the Lord is not slack concerning his promise his promises in the covenant they're covenant promises they're covenant promises they're promises in Christ as some men count slackness but is long suffering to usward <laughs> To usward, not willing that any of usward would perish, but that all of usward would come to repentance. That's the meaning of the verse. And that's consistent with everything else in Scripture. First Timothy chapter 2. See, whole doctrines, denominations... Um, whole heresies have been have been uh, preached and been believed based on verses of scripture pulled out of context and used to defend a position that they had that they wanted to prove and here's another one um 
Verse chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, there were, there were Roman um, governors and kings that were arresting and persecuting believers. Now, if you had a, if we lived in such an environment, you might come to the conclusion, well, there's not any way that that person's going to be saved. Uh, they, they're, God, they're beyond God's grace. No, I said this last Wednesday night, I'll say it again. If you think that there's anybody that's beyond the grace of God, and you don't pray for them because you think that they're beyond the grace of God, now we don't pray for anybody as we ought to. You know, you know why you don't pray for me more than you do? Same reason I don't pray for you more than I do. We're all so consumed with ourselves, we can't think of much about anybody else, can we? Isn't that the truth? But if you fail to pray for somebody because you believe that they are beyond salvation, at that point you cease to become the chief of all sinners. And that's what this passage is teaching. That yes, those men that are leading the, the, the persecution against the church can even be saved. <laughs> and what the Lord's saying, if God can save you, he can save anybody. And so he says, pray for them. For kings and for all that are in authority. That we may live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now if God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All men would be saved. What's he talking about? He said all kinds of men. There's no exception. There's no, there's no, he, he's saying that, you know, just because a person is in this, uh, is in this situation doesn't mean that they're beyond salvation. If there's breath, there's hope. <laughs> Pray for them. Uh, God's not, God's willing to, God's going to save all kinds of men. Some noble, some not noble. Uh, uh, some rich, some poor. You know, most of these churches that Paul's writing to, half the congregation was made up of slaves. Slaves. So how do you know that? Well, the Lord speaks to them, to encourages them. And we know historically that, that most of these cities were, were at least half slaves. Half the population of every one of these cities were, were, were men and women in bondage. And uh, so the Lord said, you know, he can save a slave. He can save a king. <laughs> Don't set in your mind that there's certain kinds of people that God's going to save and there's other kinds of people he's not going to save. He's going to save all kinds of men. But you see how people will take these, these, these verses because they're going to the word of God with these preconceived ideas that God loves everybody, Christ died for everybody, God wants to save everybody, and man's got a free will. And so they find verses to support their position. And none of it's true. And it's contrary to what the rest of Scripture teaches. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 21. Have you not known... Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? <laughs> now, it's beyond my comprehension. But there are actually people who take that one verse of scripture and conclude that the earth is not a spinning ball in space that it actually is built on pillars that it's a flat stationary earth that's built on stationary pillars because God said it has foundations <laughs> it's amazing now look at the next verse verse 22 it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and they will say, 
the earth is like a tortilla. <laughs> it's like a flying saucer. It's like a, it's like a frisbee. It's just, it, it's, and it's built on pillars because that's what God says. I'm not kidding you. I am not. I mean, there are people who will die for that, that believe that with all their heart. And that have said, that have confessed, I will die for this truth. Because this is what God's word said, and I'm going, to marry, I'm going to remain faithful and loyal to the word of God. And completely ignore the rest of the scripture. <laughs> I mean, look at the rest of verse 21. And the inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers. So if you're going to say, they say, well, see, the Bible says the earth is a circle, not a globe. And it says it's on foundations. Well, it also says that the inhabitants are grasshoppers. So what's that make us all grasshoppers? And the heaven is like a curtain and a tent. Does that mean that the heaven's like a tent? Is it is a tent? You see, the Bible's written in symbolic language that has to be understood in the context of what God's saying. If 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 our prayer is going to be answered, if the word of God is going to have free course and be glorified, it must be taught, it must be preached, it must be believed according to what it means, not what we want it to mean, what it actually does mean. Secondly, if the word of God is going to be blessed, if the gospel is going to run its race and have free course and glorify God, then what we preach must point to Christ. It must point to Christ. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God. Now, we, we know, that you know what did the Lord say to the Pharisees. He said the same thing that needs to be said to a lot of religious folks today. You know, you're, you're very proud of your scholarship. You think that you understand the Bible. You study it diligently. You, you do your word studies and, you, and, and, you, and you've got your theological uh, departments all figured out. But the Lord said, these are they which testify of me. You missed the meaning of the Bible if you haven't seen Christ. Paul said, we, we, we preach Christ and him crucified. From all the counsel of God's word, we keep coming back to the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he accomplished. He's the successful savior of sinners. He's the sovereign son of God. He's the one who's holy and undefiled and separate from sinners. He's higher than the heavens. He actually accomplished the work of redemption on behalf of, of his people. He put away their sins, put them away once and for all by the sacrifice of himself. And, and from, from in the beginning God to come Lord Jesus even now come. Now that's the first and last verse of the Bible. It's all about him. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. If we, if we want to compartmentalize history and doctrine and theology and, and all these other things in order, to, in order to promote ourselves, that's all it is. It's just self It always comes back to self-righteousness. She said, why would somebody pervert the scriptures? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, they're looking to gain a following to themselves on some particular uh, view um, uh, or they are believing that God has revealed something to them that he hadn't revealed to anybody else he's, they're special in the sight of God 
they've got a special access to God and they promote themselves as being more virtuous and more dedicated and more committed to the Bible than anybody else. It's, it, it, it's, it's always self-righteousness. It's always self-promotion. Lord, we pray that the word of the Lord would have free course and that it would be glorified. We want Christ to be glorified. We're not interested in glorifying a man. We're interested, we're not interested in glorifying a doctrine. We're interested in glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I have, turn with me to John chapter 17. I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse 1, John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son. <laughs> if the word of God has free course, if God answers our prayer to, to, to bless the preaching of his word according to what it means, then Christ will be glorified. Father, glorify thy son. That's what the Lord's praying for. He's praying, Lord, glorify me. That the Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. <laughs> I've got the power to give eternal life, and I'm going to give it to everyone that you gave to me. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. This is, the, this is the purpose of the scripture. This is the purpose of preaching. Not to discover some deep, dark secret that no one else knows. It's to know him. <laughs> this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. <laughs> what was the Lord's first words recorded in scripture? Woman? Speaking to his mother. She's looking for him for three days. I'm sure she was frantic. You knew. You of all people know who I am. You know that I was conceived in your womb without you ever being with a man. If anybody else ever doubted that, you never did. You watched me for 12 years. You know who I am. You know that I must be about my father's business. Where was his father's business? It was in the house of prayer, wasn't it? Why didn't you come here first? You knew this where I'd be. <laughs> and what was his father's business? The redemption of his people. Christ came to save sinners. And what was the last thing he said from Calvary's cross? It is finished. Father, now I commend my spirit to thy hands. I, I, I'm finished the work. I finished the work that you gave me to do. I've glorified you glorified myself I've saved your people this is pray that the word of God would have free course and be glorified if it's going to be glorified it's got to be preached according to what it means we can't twist it we can't pervert it we can't take out a verse or a word or a phrase and create some kind of weird doctrine for our own promotion we, we go to the word of God and we preach Christ. Preach the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's pleased to glorify the Son in the hearts of his people and to cause them to know him. To know him. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were and thou gavest them unto me. They have kept thy word. Look at, uh, look at verse 22. 
and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. What is his glory? What is his glory? His glory is sinless perfection. That's his glory. And he said, the glory that you, I've given it to them. In the new nature, they have sinless perfection before God. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. And now that's the sixth time in this one prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to the Father saying, I'm praying for those that thou hast given me. I pray not for the world, I pray for them which thou hast given me out of the world. I pray that they be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. Christ is the glory of God. And it's all for his glory. It's all for his glory. This is all about the glory of God. All right, go back with me to 2 Thessalonians. So for the, for the word of the Lord to have free course, for the word of the Lord to, glor to be glorified, it's got to be preached and believed according to what it means. And it means what it says. And how do we determine what it means? Well, we compare scripture by scripture. If you come to a conclusion on one verse of scripture that's not consistent with the rest of scripture, then that conclusion's wrong. It's just that simple. We compare the spiritual to the spiritual. This book does not contradict itself. It, it teaches itself. <laughs> scripture teaches scripture. I've given you several examples of people who have, uh, have taken verses that, and come to conclusions that are contrary to everything else that the Bible says. And then secondly, if the, if the Lord's going to answer this prayer, then Christ has to be preached. He has to be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw men to me. So that's what we're, we're preaching Christ. Wherever we go in the Bible, we find a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. And that you may be delivered from unreasonable. You know what that word unreasonable, I've got it in the margin of my Bible. It says absurd. And there are some absurd ideas out there that men conclude from the Bible. I just gave you one of them, flat earth. That's absurd. That's unreasonable. And, the, and, and, and Lord, deliver me from anything like that. Don't let, me, don't let me be deceived by some unreasonable absurdity. And wicked men, for all men have not faith. Now, can a, person, can a person be deceived for a period of time? Yeah. A believer? Yeah. But if, they, if they're the Lord's, they won't stay deceived. They won't remain in that error. The Lord, and Paul deals with that in this very chapter. I want to get to those verses. Look what he says. But the Lord is faithful <laughs> the Lord is faithful oh there's our hope let God be true and every man a liar when we're not faithful he remaineth faithful he's faithful to his covenant promises he's faithful to his children he's not going to lose one of I, I, I fear sometimes when I when I see someone going astray into a into a into a, a heresy or an error that they get from the Bible but the only comfort that I have is I know if that person's a child of God, they'll be back. They'll be back. The Lord is faithful. Turn with me to Psalm 106. This is, this is my hope <laughs> because 
we read that passage in Ephesians chapter 5, the wiles of the devil. Oh, he's, he's deceitful. And the heart is wicked and deceitful beyond anything that we know. And no man can know his own heart. Are you capable of being deceived? Am I capable of being deceived? Led astray? Yeah. If it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Why is it not possible? Because they're smarter? No. Because God is faithful. He's faithful to his children. He's not going to let them be deceived. Look at Psalm 106, and we'll begin reading at verse 42. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection unto their hand. Have you ever been? You you know you've been deceived. You've been deceived by sin, haven't you? You're deceived by it all the time, aren't you? And that's your biggest enemy. Many times did he deliver them. (laughs) How many times has he delivered you out of the snares of the devil? But they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry and he remembered them for his covenant. He remembered them. For them, he remembered for them his covenant. (laughs) God is faithful. He made a covenant promise to himself before time ever began. The Father promised the Son a bride. The Son promised the Father redemption. The Holy Spirit promised the Son and the Father regeneration. That's the covenant. And God says... When you're not faithful and you, and you let your enemies overtake you and you fall to them, I'm going to let you be afflicted by them. I'm going to be, let you be afflicted by your sin until you cry out. And then I'm going to answer that cry, but I'm not going to answer the cry because you cried. I'm going to answer the cry because I remember my covenant. <laughs> That's why I'm going to answer it. You see, if God had to answer our prayers to deliver us because of our cry, then we're left with wondering, how sincere was my cry? Did I really mean it? Was I broken enough? Was I repentant enough? Was I sorrowful enough? No, I'm going to let you get afflicted by your enemy until you cry. And when you cry, I'm going to answer. But I'm not answering you because you cried or how hard you cried, or how loud you cried, I'm answering you because I remembered my covenant. I'm faithful to my promises. (laughs) It's impossible for me to lie. Everything I've ever promised you, all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. What hope? There's our hope. It's not on how sorrowful you, you can't be sorrowful enough. You're going to be sorrowful. If you're a child of God, you disobey the Lord. He knows how to chastise his children. If you're not chastised, you're not a child of God. And you will be afflicted. We all know what that means. But when God answers our prayer, it's not because we prayed with such great earnest or sincerity. It's because right here, look look at it again. Verse uh, verse 45, and he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, save us. All right, go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Established by the word. The word that is preached and believed according to what it means. The word that points to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the word that although unreasonable and wicked men would pervert it, and a lot of times they'll pervert it with, with just wanting you to compromise. You remember when, when, when uh, Darius sent uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, uh, um, Nehemiah, thank you, Nehemiah, back to rebuild the wall, and, um, and, and there, were, there were two men, Tobiah and, um, and uh, Samballot, thank you, Tobiah and Samballot, who tried to get Nehemiah to stop the work. And they kept sending him letters. <laughs> you know, come down, come down. And what did Nehemiah say? He said, well, we've got a great work God's given us. We're not going to stop this work. And what did the letter say from Sanballat and Tobiah? Come down to the valley of Ono and let's talk about it. Now you can look it up in your Bible. The word Ono in that verse means common. Let's find some common ground. Let's just agree to disagree on the non-essentials and let's just all get along. And we all worship the same God and we all believe the same thing. No, we don't. No, we don't. We're not coming down to the Valley of Ono. We've got a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. <laughs> and, and we're going to keep putting the rocks down and we're going to protect us uh, against our enemy. And we're not going to quit working. But nothing's changed, has it? The perverse, absurd, unreasonable, unbelieving men still would have you to say, well, let's just agree to disagree. Let's just compromise. No, we can't compromise the truth. We want to be at peace with all men whenever possible, but it's not possible to be at peace with anyone if it means compromising the gospel. But the Lord is faithful. Look at, look at <laughs> verse 3. The Lord is faithful. He will establish you. He will establish. He's going he's to put your feet on that rock. He's going to give you a place to stand. You're going to trip and fall many times. He's going to pick you back up. Just like you're teaching a child to walk. Every time they fall, you're right there to pick them up, put them back on their feet, aren't you? And that's the way the Lord is. He just, I'm going to establish you. You're going to, I'm going to teach you how to walk. You're going to walk after me. I'm going to keep you from evil. Oh, Lord, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. They're, they're, this world is full of evil. Our own old nature is full of evil, isn't it? Lord, deliver me. Deliver me from myself. Deliver me from the wrath of God. Deliver me from the, from the wiles of the devil. Deliver me from the, from the deceitfulness of this world. This world just, you know, I've been thinking about lately. That, you know what the secret to being happy is? Being content. Being content. Content with whatever you've got. Now, first and foremost, that means being content with Christ. I'm content with what the Lord Jesus Christ did to satisfy the demands of God's law. I don't want to add to it or take away from it. I'm content with what the Lord Jesus Christ did in shedding his precious blood as a covering for my sin. I don't want to add anything to it or take anything away from it. I don't want to add my sorrow, my repentance, my faith, anything. I'm content with what the Lord Jesus Christ has done all by himself for all my righteousness and all of my justification before God. I'm content with that. And faith is content with that. We have to be brought back to that contentment, don't we? We lose sight of it and we, and we lose our joy. Because we become discontent. Every time you try to add to or take something away from the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you become discontent, don't you? You, become, you? you lose your joy. And, and that's the, the world is just caught. You know, everything that advertisement is designed to do is make you discontent. 
Every, every advertisement you see on TV, that's its design. If I can make you discontent, then I, can, then I can force you to pull some money out of your pocket and buy my product. Because you're not going to be happy unless you have it. <laughs> and we just live in a world of discontent, don't we? And unhappy people. What does the scripture say? If you have food and shelter, be content. <laughs> Paul said, I'm content in whatever state I'm in. Lord, deliver me. Deliver me from the evils of this world that would cause me to be discontent with Christ and discontent with your providence and your blessings in my life. <laughs> Deliver me from evil. It's all evil, isn't it? Every bit of it. It's more evil than we think it is. Make me content <laughs> with what you've given me. In Christ, in your word, in providence, in blessings, Lord, make me content. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you. Look at verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you. Our confidence is not in you. And your confidence doesn't need to be in me. <laughs> not ultimately. Well, we ought to be confident with one another. We ought to be, we, we ought to be faithful to each other. And, 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 uh, and to that sense, we are. But, but Paul's saying, when it comes to being delivered from evil, when it comes to the, full, for the, for the salvation of men's souls, our confidence is not in one another. Our confidence is in the Lord. In another place, he said, we are the true circumcision which worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We're not, yeah, that's, why, that's why he's saying if, you, if somebody is deceived and led astray is our confidence in their ability to figure it out and come back? No. Our confidence is in the Lord's faithfulness. That's what he's saying. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you. Concerning you. Our confidence is in the Lord. That you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts unto the love of God. That's where the issue is, isn't it? It's in the heart. This is a heart matter. And what the Lord does in the heart can't be changed. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You want to know what somebody believes? Listen to what they say. A good tree cannot bring bad, bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bring bad good fruit. Yeah, I know the religious take that and they say, well, we need to do some fruit inspection and make sure you've got good things going on in your life. Make sure you don't have any bad things going on in your life. That, that very passage of scripture talks about the fruit of the lips. Turn, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at that before we close. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make a tree good and the fruit good, or either make a tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure in his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now that doesn't mean that you get angry and you say things you shouldn't say. He's talking about what you say about the gospel, what you say about God's word, what you say about Christ. Because what you say is what you believe. Out of the abundance of the heart, a good tree brings forth good fruit. What do you say about Christ? What do you say about the word of God? Does it mean what it says? Is it all about him? Do 
you need to be delivered from evil? Is God faithful? Is he faithful? Yeah, he is. John said, they went out from us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have remained. But they went out that those which are true might be made manifest. Now that's the faithfulness of God. If a man's able to leave and follow after some, some foolish heresy and not come back, then he's only proving himself to be not of the Lord. Lord, keep us. Keep us. Make your word to have free course in my heart and then let it run. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for your word and we're thankful for your spirit. We thank you especially, Lord Jesus, for the, for the work of redemption that you have accomplished and how we pray that you would keep us from evil and cause us to, to keep looking to Christ, resting in him, and believing what you have declared in your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 175. Let's stand together. 175. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.